Tom Flick, welcome to the Eagles Talent Training Now program. Uh, so glad you can join us today. Sheldon, thanks for having me. Good to see you again. You too. Uh, Tom, technology uh, and the economy has changed over the last few years. Um, how do you think that has changed leadership? Well, Sheldon, that's a great question. I think the challenge has been that we've been um, experienced so much change, continuous change. We've left episodic change. Um, 20, 30 years ago, change would roll around and we'd find a way to manage that change. We'd put committees together mm -hmm. and teams and they'd go out and, and defeat it. What's different today is that change is happening so fast with globalization and technology and new companies and competition coming onto the market that we really need leadership. The old model just doesn't work anymore. And so what leaders need to do is they need to be fully aware of the of the hazards and really seek out the opportunities mm -hmm. which is a leadership mindset set not really a management mindset and that's that's a huge distinction in this changing world that we live in today you, you have spoken uh, for some of the biggest and most successful companies out there uh, is there a, a main message you find yourself sharing lately I think the key is really uh, getting people aware of this leadership versus management distinction and why it's increasingly important we basically are, uh, the default in the brain is a management default. I call it managerial mindsets. And we manage our schedules. We manage our uh, exercise routines. We manage everything. Mm -hmm. It's the easiest way for the brain to really compartmentalize information. And so what we do, even in leadership positions, we fall into management mindsets, which is basically controlling, budgeting, staffing, smart problem solving, um, we have a leadership title, but we still go after things with a management mindset. Nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying leadership is good and management is bad. I'm just saying that leadership really is the name of the game in this ever-increasing world that we live in of change and competition. And so the message is really that, that awareness piece, but also in that piece is the understanding of true urgency. Mm -hmm. The urgency that says that, you know, when I come to work, I'm seeking the quickest, fastest, best way to win today. Right. I'm going to look out and check for the obstacles and hazards and avoid them and also seize those big opportunities that roll around every single day. And if it's on my calendar and it doesn't advance the ball any further down the field, then I'm going to jettison low priority items off that calendar to make sure that our team is winning. And so it's really a matter of true urgency where we come to work. The opposite uh, and the challenge, Sheldon, is um, complacency and false urgency. Mm -hmm. Really a uh, champion and noted by Harvard professor Dr. John Cotter, uh, the world's foremost authority on change leadership. Mm -hmm. And complacency is this sleepy, steadfast contentment with the status quo. It's basically a mindset that says, what I'm doing is just fine. Mm -hmm. um, we fall into that mindset. It's very easy. It's based on past success, mm -hmm. um, even success that may have happened a decade ago. So that's the challenge. True, true urgency is the answer. And when I was playing football in the NFL many, many years ago, <laughs> Right. Uh, quarterbacks were taught that. that. That's an essential part of quarterbacking is to go up to the line of scrimmage before the ball is snapped and assess the defense mm -hmm. and find the hazard, which is the blitz. Right. And then if that is there, a blitz, then all blitzes, all danger creates opportunity as well. Mm -hmm. And so if that's true, where's the one-on-one -on -one coverage? Where's the single covered receiver? Where's the chance for a touchdown? And so we're finding, I'm finding, and I'm teaching a lot about getting leaders from all different levels of the organization even in sales groups, to think differently than management and think more towards leadership. Hmm. Delegating and empowering. Do you think there's a, a difference in, or is it just in the attitude? I think it's a lot in the attitude. I, I think it's really, you know, building bench strength and, and growing people. People have asked me many times, is, is someone born with leadership or they, can they develop it? And I'm a firm believer that people can actually be developed into leaders. I, I'm a firm believer that everybody can. I've seen people from years ago who, you know, uh, early uh, mid-level managers who I thought didn't have great leadership skills have come back to the company and seen that they've really developed into great leaders in that organization. So, uh, and a lot of that is based on the leadership and how they go about treating and serving and taking care of mm -hmm. uh, the people below them, their direct reports, making sure that they uh, acknowledge, that they reward, that they coach, 
Uh, leaders have to be great coaches today, uh, great high performance coaches. It's very simple to do. There's techniques that we teach, uh, but yet it's, it's a lot of times people will say, I'm not a coach. And yet I can teach uh, great leaders to say, hey, it's very easy to do. Here's a couple steps. Here's a couple questions. And this is the process. And I think in that process, you start to delegate. Otherwise, if you don't, I think if, if we keep demanding, if we keep having um, leaders that are really forth, I mean, uh, forceful, um, authoritarian is what the word I'm looking for. If you're authoritarian, it, it just doesn't work. It doesn't grow leadership. It, right. People wait around to be told what to do next. Right. And if you're a micromanagement manager, it doesn't really, as a leader, it doesn't really move people forward fast. People just, there's too many steps involved in micromanagement. Mm -hmm. And so what we need to do is we need to be that type of leader that really casts the vision for the future, uh, says this is a compelling picture, this connects the head and the heart, this is why we're going there, this is the benefit, and let's go, and they lead the way. Can uh, leaders sometimes get that uh, superhero complex and try to do too much? Think? I think so, but I think I think it's the 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 era of the one charismatic leader leading the organization is long gone. Mm. I think change is coming so fast at us that we need to empower so many different people through all levels of the organization. Uh, John Cotter is an alliance partner, Dr. Cotter, with myself. Uh, it's been an honor working with him, getting to know him and his concepts. But he teaches a great concept of really getting a volunteer army together and rallying around a big opportunity. Uh, chasing that big dream where it's compelling, where it connects the head and the heart, where people say, I want to be part of this, not just a senior leadership team um, coming together as a committee and then, you know, um, managing the process of change. It's really getting people from all levels of the organization involved right. to really tackle change and be excited about what the company can become. Right. And, he, and you really kind of help to create a great culture, too, within a company, right? Absolutely. People want skin in the game. They want to know that, uh, you know, if you look at a, an old study called the Lindell study, they asked thousands of employees and thousands of their uh, uh, their bosses, you know, what, what they wanted. Well, it was dis decidedly different. The employee said, I want skin in the game. I want to be rewarded. I want to be recognized. I want to help make decisions. I want to be part of the change. Uh, getting a raise was sixth on the list of 10. <laughs> and uh, they asked employees, what did you think, they, how your employees answered? And they said, well, right away, we believe that they wanted a raise. Well, they didn't want a raise. That was sixth on the list. They want to be part of something great. They want to be part of something bigger than themselves. And leaders right. are called to really create that atmosphere and that culture so they can go ahead and do that. Right. A raise is good, too. <laughs> <laughs> a raise is good, too. Yes, it is. Uh, who are some of your favorite leaders and, and why? Well, you know, um, my mother and my father were wonderful leaders uh -huh. in their servant attitude and how they cared about people and didn't seek out any. Uh, I, I like the leaders who don't seek out glory for themselves. My favorite would be Abraham Lincoln, uh, Martin Luther King Jr., uh, Winston Churchill, people that really did some amazing things. If you look at Churchill, he didn't say, if I do this, will you do this for me in return? <laughs> you know, he said things and they used powerful words right. that, really, that really hit at the heartstrings of those who they were leading, that turned anxiety into action, that manifested itself in all different types of ways. Churchill would say things like, we're going to fight in the hills and in the streets and on the beaches. We're never, never, never going to give up. Um, if you look at Dr. King, he said, I see little uh, white boys and white girls holding hands with little black boys and black girls in harmony. Uh, we're judged not by the content, uh, the, of the words we use, but the content of our character, not the color of our skin. Really impactful words that really changed the direction of where their generations were at that time. And so I love those types of men and women who speak in that type of form. You know, my son and I, we, uh, we went to uh, D.C. a year ago, and we stood on the steps of uh, Lincoln Memorial. And while we were standing there, we stood in that spot where Martin Luther King delivered his speech, and I had my, uh, my phone with me. We played that video of uh, the I Have a Dream speech. And it was really impacting you know, for, for him to imagine that whole area filled with people in that moment. Uh, well, quite amazing. He, you know, it, it, I bet it was, Sheldon. Can you imagine uh, Dr. King if he stood up and said, I have a strategic plan. <laughs> right. I, I don't <laughs> Would have gotten over so well. I don't think so. Right. <laughs> and what I find so true in organizations right. that people don't rally around 43 initiatives. They right. rally around a big vision or a big dream that's communicated very well and the reasons behind it. And actually, if you look at Dr. King, the legislation that year, civil rights legislation, mm -hmm was really doomed to fail until he gave that speech. Mm. And so that manifested itself in that actually being passed. 
by the by the power of the words that he chose. And I find that leaders speak with what I call a leader's voice. A leader's voice is something that amplifies uh, like a megaphone over a bad year or shareholder pressure or a difficult economy or trying times. A leader's voice really speaks about hope and optimism and uh, really gives leadership away, builds autonomy so people can say, yes, let's go do this together. And that's how leaders really differentiate themselves from managers. So uh, we're in political season. I'm not going to ask you uh, any uh, political choices or anything, but uh, but when you look at whether it's city, state, local, uh, or, or, or um, national government, uh, there's going to be change in leadership, you know, all around, and there's always changes constant. And whether uh, you're in the uh, political field or even a corporation, leadership changes. Um, so taking it from the other side of employees, how do you adapt or, or to new leadership? Or well, you? first of all, the leader has to be trustworthy. And, mm -hmm. and really, leaders really need to be the visible symbol of what they want other people to become. Mm -hmm. That's why great leaders don't really hide out in their offices. They're always that visible symbol out showing people and demonstrating and getting to know people and building trust. I, I think that's vitally important. We don't really grow great trust by being behind a computer or in an ivory tower. So I really encourage leaders to get out and, and to get connected with their people and really know who they are and what their challenges are. So that's first and foremost in anything. I think also, too, is that great leaders realize that change, the best way to go through change is swiftly. People think, you know, we'll meter it out and do it slowly. Really, that, that's much harder on the employees. When you come out with a plan and it's decisive and here's the benefits behind it mm -hmm. and you've got a plan to put it together, uh, that's much more beneficial to the employees. And so that kind of a connection from the employee standpoint, looking at someone who they can trust and also from a, a leader who understands really how do I create change? If you think about the statistics, Sheldon, 70% of all uh, big initiative, change initiatives, they fail. Mm -hmm. There's only 25 to 30% of them that really succeed. And because people, leaders, and senior leadership teams are still using the same old model back in the 70s and 80s hmm. when they faced change then, and they're still trying to use that model today, mm -hmm. and it's not working. All right. So is there anything more intense than a two-minute drill? No, no, but there's probably, <laughs> there's probably is to a lot of people, but for me, in my experience, probably the most exhilarating because you're, you're the, the tether from the sidelines has been cut. It's, it's your time. You need to know the system, how things work, manage the time, lead the team. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing could be more fun. I love the two-minute drill, mm -hmm. and I love the exhilaration of the old time of playing. I don't think I could have found that anyplace else, but I do find it's interesting when you can see organizations who manage and lead change. And you, have, you need both. Don't get me wrong. I'm not right. throwing management out. That is hugely critical. Right. But when you can see that really happen in an organization and they can take on change and really gain market share or launch a new product, it's an exciting thing to see. Well, uh, Tom, it's been a, a really a true pleasure having you on on the uh, our Eagles Talent Training Now, and uh, thank you so much for joining us. Sheldon, been a pleasure. Always good seeing you.